So good morning once again. We already have Justice Kanade here. So in keeping with the theme of the voice of women, we have with us today a personage who has dedicated a large part of his professional life to help empower women. In this session of yours truly, PILF presents Justice Vidya Sagar Kanade. Justice Vidya Sagar Kanade is a retired justice of the Bombay High Court and has given several landmark judgments in his career spanning 16 years. His judgments have reformed the society by empowering women, senior citizens and victims to name a few. One of his most popular judgments lifted the ban on women entering the inner sanctum of the Haji Ali Dargah on the 24th of August 2016. Justice Vidya Sagar Murlidhar Kanade, popularly known as VM Kanade, was the sitting judge of the Bombay High Court from the year 2001 to 2017. He has ordered that the shops where firecrackers are stored should be located in open spaces and not in residential areas. He has also ordered the Central and the Western Railway authorities to make new infrastructural facilities for the disabled. He confirmed the death sentences of the rogue bus driver Santosh Mane for moving down nine people in Pune. He has ordered the government of Maharashtra to move children with normal intelligence quotient from the homes where rescued children are kept to regular shelter homes, thus resulting in the rehabilitation of 93 children. He has also advised all the education boards in Maharashtra on, uh, to make mathematics an optional subject in class 10th. He further ordered the confiscation of unauthorized loudspeakers and he directed the police to prohibit the use of loudspeakers between 10 o'clock in the night and 6 a.m. in the morning. When a school in Mumbai refused to give admission to a student in junior KG for want of funds, he informed the school that he would himself pay so that the child may not be deprived of getting education. <laughs> he has ordered that in the case of child adoption, where one of the couple is an Indian national and the other of a foreign origin, then such an adoption would be termed as in-country adoption and not inter-country adoption. He ordered a group of Muslim youth who has approached for quashing of an FIR to clean the mosque and visit some jails in the state to witness the conditions inside these jails as that is what they will have to face if they do not mend their ways. He has protected the senior citizens in a family by declaring that a house owned by in-laws could not be treated as a shared household. He protected the creativity of an author in the famous case of Marzban Shroff versus Mudra publication. He confirmed the death sentence for a duo for a brutal rape and murder of a woman employee of a BPO in Pune in the year 2007. The Supreme Court upheld the capital punishment and the then President of India, Sri Prana Mukherjee, upheld it too. Recognizing the need of safety for women traveling alone after working late, he directed the state to take steps to ensure a safe and a secure commute for such women. Justice Vidya Sagar Murlidhar Kanade, the judge who gave solutions with order retired on the 22nd of July 2017, graciously confessing, I am free to smile now. <laughs> he will be in conversation with Priyanka Chaturvedi, the national spokesperson of the National Congress. We have just heard Priyanka speak. Priyanka was recently honored with an award for excellence in a field of work and for being amongst the top 50 inspirational women in Maharashtra at a Women's Leadership Symposium. So can we have a big round of applause for Justice Vidya Sagar Kanade and Priyanka Chaturvedi. Can I now request Mr. Rahul Karat to come up on the dais and uh, felicitate Justice Kanade and Priyanka Chaturvedi along with the director of the program, Dr. Manjari Prabhu. <laughs> His Lordship Justice Vidya Sagar Kanade. I request you, Priyanka, to start off with the session. Thank you so much. So, uh, a very warm welcome to you, sir. So, how, how we're going to do this uh, discussion is um, 
I'll have Sir ha uh, speak about his own experience, his rich experience that he comes up with. 16 years of, you know, fighting our battles, empowering us, empowering children, making them understand their own rights that they deserve in this country. I would want him to speak about his own experience. I will be asking him some questions, perhaps some uncomfortable ones too, sir. <laughs> and also uh, would have our audience participate with their questions, and that would happen for the next, uh, you know, for the first half hour we are doing this uh, 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 question and answers, then we can have audience also participating with their questions. So over to you, sir. Yeah. So good morning. Good morning to every one of you. And uh, I'm very happy to come to Pune. I have some very nostalgic memories of Pune because I did my graduation from Pune University. And those were the days when I think the population of Pune was six lakhs. And uh, I studied my, no, not law, did my graduation in the Commerce Faculty in 75, between 72 to 75 from BMCC. So those were the days when model colony did not have big storied buildings and bungalows. And uh, Vaishali and Rupali were still there. And there used to be, you know, record libraries where we students used to go and listen to music by paying 25 paise for a long, a big LP record. And I still remember there was a fruit stall, fruit juice stall in front of uh, Vaishali where we could get a chiku milkshake for one rupee and 25 paise. <laughs> and of course all the PCH as it then was, Puna Coffee House, where all the students and I think many political leaders used to come in the morning. Of course, those were the days. And uh, every time I come to Pune, I get goosebumps and I feel very excited. So thank you very much. I must thank the Foundation International Pune Festival organizers for inviting me here to meet this group of intelligent people who are here to answer the queries, both comfortable as well as uncomfortable. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I don't know how many of you are aware, and I'm sure if there were children in the audience, they'd be very happy to note that uh, sir had some time back before retirement, I believe, he had spoken about making maths an optional subject for class 10 students. <laughs> <laughs> for mothers, it's a nightmare, very honestly. <laughs> you wouldn't want your child to drop any subject whatsoever. But he came up with this radical um, idea to consider uh, uh, making uh, class 10 maths an optional subject. So I'm sure, and I, I remember reading it and wondering why, uh, you know, uh, I hope my son doesn't read this and I hope, <laughs> you know, it doesn't become a judgment really. But uh, what makes you believe that, you know, uh, I, I thought I would start with this, that children are being overburdened and marks have become the most important way to seek admission and for their future car careers also are dependent on subjects perhaps they do not like. Right. So what, was that your belief when you no, uh, I came across asked for this consideration? Yeah, I came across a huge number of students who dropped out of school in their fifth, sixth, or particularly after the ninth standard. With the result, all those doors which should have opened for them for further education were permanently closed. And most of them came from uh, a poor background where it was not possible for them to go to a class, coaching class, and uh, study mathematics. And invariably, students failed in two subjects. One was mathematics and the second was English. And I remember sometime back, maybe in the 60s and early 70s, the SSC board did have this uh, format 
where a student could take eight subjects and even if he failed in mathematics and if he passed in other seven subjects, he could take admission to the college. And I have seen many students who failed and I have now become very successful in their particular fields. So I felt that uh, why not, uh, why there should be a compulsion. I can understand you are doing your chartered accountancy. You are doing your technical subjects, science subjects, where mathematics is the foundation of uh, understanding physics, understanding chemistry, understanding the various uh, technical subjects. But for a person who has nothing to do with science and is say for example a lawyer, a lawyer needs more understanding of logic than of course as lawyers we have to study over a period of time even mathematics but then for passing out this is what I have felt and those who are interested in choosing science as their career obviously they must appear for mathematics as a subject in the state of Maharashtra particularly I don't know why, what is the reason. The number of people who do not pass in English and in mathematics is almost more than 60 percent. Yeah. So say if say 15 lakhs students appear for SSC examination, more than 7 lakhs don't get through and then permanently their education is stopped. So therefore I felt maybe several new avenues can be opened for them. And uh, this was of course I am not an expert in education though I am, I have been teaching since 1976. Both in the junior college then in law and university. But still I am not an expert in examinations and but this is what I felt out of sheer practical Perspective. Perspective. Makes sense. Oh, and uh, I'm sure many mothers would also be happy <laughs> with that reduced burden if it was considered. Well, I must tell you one more thing. <laughs> I am really pained uh, to see uh, my granddaughter is six and a half years old. And she attends one, one tuition teacher comes twice in a week. Then uh, she has to, she goes to a chess class. Then there's a crafts class, <laughs> <laughs> then football class, six and a half years old. So I believe that sometimes mothers are ambitious and they should be. That is why we are here today. But still, I, you shouldn't overburden a child to such an extent that the originality of that person child is, is lost. Yes, you know, uh, I must share my own anecdote. I was so, uh, as a child, I was very keen on learning squash, but somehow for some reason I could not. And I kept pushing my son to learn. And it wasn't definitely his area of interest, but I said, no, no, you've got to do it because I couldn't do it. <laughs> so yes, sometimes it does overlap. Um, my second question to you would be on a judgment which was uh, perhaps the most uh, 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 noticed, most discussed, most covered, and of course, there were many protests happening from all groups, which was the Haji Ali Darga entry to uh, women in the Haji Ali Darga's Sanctum Sanctorum. So as a judge who was going to be taking a decision on something as critical as that, which had religious connotations, which had pressure coming from various groups, coming from the government perhaps as well, how do you as a judge handle something like this? And very uh, recently we had the triple talaq discussion, but mm. again, there were five judges there. Uh, uh, had taking their own decisions. So what kind of pressure do you come under when, you're, when a particular case is under so much scrutiny and has so much importance and relevance for the time to come? Yeah, you're right. But you know, it's possibly years of uh, experience as a judge and as a lawyer uh, somehow prepares you to take that uh, pressure along with, it comes with the job. And secondly, when a matter comes before you, either you have to 
pass an order in favor of the plaintiff or the petitioner or the respondent. So you have to take one side. You don't have any other option. You can't say, no, 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 I will not decide. So one way or the other, you have to take a decision. And that is what uh, many people say that the most difficult part is to take a decision. Lawyers come and argue and of course quote their fees in lakhs <laughs> per day. <laughs> but uh, judges have to take a de decision. And of course this was a very, and let me tell you very often, it's a division bench judgment. And I was sitting with Justice uh, Revati Dere Patil and I persuaded her to write the judgment. I said, you are a woman, though you are a junior judge, I am asking you to write that judgment and she has delivered the judgment. It would be better accepted, you think? Because of woman judges coming up with this no, judgment and she's that reading that it uh, out? Maybe a woman would be in a better position to you know, visualize and if it took almost normally, we are supposed to give a judgment in two months. But this matter, we tried to persuade the parties and we tried to say, tell them that they see these are matters which normally courts don't interfere. In the past also, one Parsi Panchayat matter had come before me and uh, in the form of a originating summons, which is a summary kind of thing. So in that also, I took the view that no, this can't be done through a originating summons. And the uh, proper thing to do is to resolve the dispute among yourself. Eventually, wisdom dawned on the <laughs> and the two Parsi priests were uh, removed. And then finally, a solution came from within the, here we tried our best, we called the trustees, we called the activists, and both were adamant for 12 years they were they had allowed till 2012 it was allowed and suddenly so of course it uh, there is a pressure but then when we take our oath we oath that we will decide without fear and without Prejudice. favor so i believe that is the reason why and I believe that uh, it was accepted by the trustees. And now they found a solution. So solution came from the court. So th that is where I have another question to ask of you. And I think for the larger interest of the people to know. At many times when decisions don't go in favor of, let's say, the pa a, a government in power, or for the litigant or for uh, anybody who's come up with um, uh, this entire issue, they sometimes talk about the judiciary exceeding their brief. Judiciary doing way more than the Constitution has given them powers to. Uh, the accusations you've heard over time. Uh, um, so when, when a PIL is filed, if, uh, I would want to know, yeah. when a PIL is filed, does that also give the judiciary a reason to interfere in places? I'm using the word interfere simply because that comes from many uh, quarters in aspects which they do not really need to be involved in. What is your take on that? And uh, where do you think uh, this entire argument stems from where, where the courts need to draw the line and the judiciary needs to draw the line? I believe uh, you're right that uh, a, there's a strong sense of feeling among the general public at large and political parties and the government that in many cases the high court or the Supreme Court, they uh, do this exercise of judicial activism, which is unwarranted and which the executive and the legislature is uh, more competent to deal with, has been asked by the constitution to deal with. But uh, you know there are situations where sometimes while exercising your power under 226, the courts are compelled. I'll give you an example. I was hearing criminal bail applications. This was way back in 2008. And uh, those are all murder and all other types of cases. I noticed that out of 10 matters, four cases were relating to atrocities on women. 
dowry deaths, suicide, abatement of suicide, and uh, several other uh, child child violations, abuse, sexual assault. After a month, I said to myself, "Am I just going to sit here with folded hands and just decide bail granted, bail refused?" I said, "No, I." I also have a social obligation as a judge, and if nobody is really interested or noticing this, I am telling you it was terrible uh, feeling of helplessness. So I called the Advocate General. I was sitting single, not even on a division bench or a rich court. So I told them how much uh, I can't give any order, even as a division bench rich judge, on financial aspects. But how much do you spend? For these women who are in distress, so he said three lakh fifty thousand for the state of Maharashtra. Can you imagine? So I said, how many centers do you have for counselling in the state of Maharashtra? He said three, Bombay, Pune, and Thana. So then I persuaded them that it is necessary, but w- because what happens is. our experience my experience as a judge is the moment a uh, applica- uh, complaint is filed under 498a the doors of, uh, of the woman entering her matrimonial house are shut for all times together so at that moment when she is thinking of committing suicide you need a place a person who can do counseling and dissuade her from so i suggested that do you have a helpline there no mtnl can provide so i directed mtnl to be made a party then mtnl said no try alone can give a free toll free helpline so i added try as a party try willingly said that we will provide a helpline in 2008 this helpline was provided by virtue of the interference or by a simple act of uh, persuading the government and i believe that is just one example yes. where uh, and unfortunately the media which you know publishes nobody gave any kind of publicity to this because this is such a important thing that women should know that there is a helpline available so only in 2011 or 12 i believe the in one of the pils i gave a direction to the government of maharashtra you please let the people know let the women know so this is just an example there are several other examples where the judge you know what happens is that in this red tape and I'll give you one more example. At Mahabaleshwar and Panjgani, there were no solid waste treatment plants, and they used to pass the bug from Jivan Pradhikaran to the Environmental Agency to the Pollution Board, and it, the matter was pending. So I brought all of them together in the court, including the contractors, including the chief. officer and uh, can you believe me you won't believe me that within year and a half both these plants became functional <laughs> because there was no delay i used to ask yes what have you done have you issued the tender if tender is issued how what is the time schedule so that is how a judge can ensure that there is proper coordination if i believe i had not taken the uh, initiative mahabaleshwar and panjgani still would not have solid waste management so you know these are some of the examples but i do agree that uh, very often there is a knee jerk reaction i must confess even if i had been a sitting judge i would have done the same thing and um, i believe that some of the matters which need to be handled by the government should be allowed to be handled by the government but there is also one other thing i must tell you 
very often there are some issues which the government doesn't want to <laughs> yes 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 so the government passes the buck passes the buck and tells it all out court has decided this we can't help it so that also happens happens yes um, but i, I think yeah, uh, but triple uh, talaq was one such instance which one triple talaq instant triple talaq i don't know <laughs> <laughs> so uh, another question that i had a few uh, besides this he's also he upheld a death conviction death sentence for a duo purushottam and pradeep kokade for a brutal 2007 rape and murder of a woman employee of a bpo in pune yeah. and you upheld that and then the pre president the outgoing president had also upheld that conviction now my question to you is while we all hail these kind of judgments and we talk about justice has been served uh, we use words like these but what do you as a judge the emotional impact s sentencing someone to death is a huge decision to make sure what do you go through uh, is there an emotional uh, um, uh, you know moment when you reflect on something like this because it's a uh, irreversible decision and secondly uh, there's another uh, death sentence that you uh, also uh, delivered Now my question to you is there are many people there is a lot of activism against the death penalty and you hear a lot about it when Yakub Memon was sentenced to death there were some newspapers which made that their headline and he was hanged you know something like this so how do you tackle the brickbats that come with a decision like this and the emotional uh, you know moments that you go through when you're taking a call on a particular case which is uh, an irreversible decision uh, which is yeah, taking someone's life yeah that's a very interesting life. question very often people do not uh, real realize the kind of uh, trauma or mental agony which the judge has to go through i remember my first death penalty case came up before me in 2003 or 4 i was a junior judge wow. and along with me justice deshpande wow. was presiding over the bench and that was a case from silvasa the driver was removed by the owner and to take revenge he kidnapped his 7 year old son murdered him first and then demanded ransom all the evidence forensic evidence was collected by the police and it proved beyond any reasonable doubt that this man had committed that gruesome offense but uh, let me tell you that it took for 8 days i could not sleep this was toss and turn because ultimately it is such a huge responsibility to sentence a person to death is you are snuffing life out of his body and you are the final authority of course supreme court is there but in the state you confirm his sentence as sessions judge when he passes that order it it comes for confirmation before the high court and that's a huge responsibility uh, even in criminal matters where you sentence a person to undergo life imprisonment so yeah it is not easy but at the same time we cannot forget now almost uh, 49 countries have abolished death penalty and uh, there are two schools of thought even in india outside in many states in united states it has been abolished except i believe in texas and but in india there are two schools of thought one who are the abolitionists and the other is that it should be retained now we as judges are bound by the judgments of the supreme court supreme court in bachan singh held that the uh, upheld the constitutionality of death penalty now once the constitutionality of death penalty is upheld and the matter comes before you you have either option of uh, convicting him and sentencing him for life or give death in the rarest of rare a lot of criticism that it is judge centric individual centric and there are no fixed rules there is some element of truth in it but then if the death penalty is valid as long as it is on the statute book 
the judge has no other option but to take a decision one way or the other. One criticism is that wherever there is circumstantial evidence, there are no direct eyewitnesses. And such matters come before us. Then, you see, normally in a criminal trial, there are two types of uh, verdicts. One is guilty and the second is not guilty. But in cases where you award death penalty, there is a third category, which I will term as lingering doubt. There is still a lingering doubt in the mind of the court whether, in fact, is he really guilty so as to warrant issuing a death penalty or he is, may not be guilty. So in such cases, I believe death penalty should not be awarded. And wherever there is a even shred of doubt in your mind, death penalty should not be resorted to. But very often, in one of the matters which came before me, that, that um, Mane's case, who mowed down several people, I think 33 died, 58 were injured. Plea of insanity was taken. That plea of insanity, prosecution could establish that was not correct. So in such cases, there is a public outcry. Now this issue had come up before the Supreme Court. In several cases, they have considered whether public outcry can be one of the factors which can be taken into consideration for awarding death penalty. And the uh, Supreme Court has said that yes, in a given case, it can be considered. And such was the outcry uh, after that incident. In my judgment, I had considered that factor also, that so many people died and uh, his plea of insanity was not correct, was a false plea. So I had to give that decision. That's, ve that's very interesting, understanding what the public also expects out of the judiciary and taking that into consideration, um, of course, holds importance, but also does that influence a lot of decision making? No, it doesn't. Ultimately, you see, we go by the evidence which is produced before us. Now, we cannot forget the fact that uh, there are several stakeholders in any trial. One is the prosecution, second is the witness, and uh, the public prosecutor, the defense lawyer, and the judge. So, depending on the type of material which is placed before the court, you have to appreciate the evidence on the touchstone of so many judgments on appreciation of evidence and then arrive at a conclusion. So the other factors come later on. First factor is whether the evidence is uh, evidence establishes the guilt of that person. Um, I don't know how many of you all are aware, but even the loudspeaker 10 p.m. decision came from Justice Kanade. So we have a lot to thank him for. I don't know where to start and where to begin, really. <laughs> then also, uh, another point when, uh, you know, he understood that how important there are women who work late hours and how important their safety is. In fact, he had approached the Chief Justice, if I'm not mistaken, asking them to take this, you know, if a public interest litigation comes to it, sue a motor PIL, if there are cases that uh, come up like that. And also, he had directed the state uh, in 2016 that it is their responsibility to ensure women's safety at whatever hour that they're working in. So I think we women have a lot to thank him for. But at the same time, I have another question for you. Uh, I believe in one of your judgments, you had said it is difficult to accept that a house owned by in-laws could be sh uh, treated as a shared household. It is difficult to consider a woman's matrimonial home as a shared household, if it is not owned by the husband, this is in, in, in uh, context to a case where a woman had approached uh, for her you know, mat uh, matrimonial rights, which I think, wouldn't you say when you read something like this, where you deny her uh, a share in a matrimonial uh, uh, case by saying that it, it did not belong to the husband, so she has no share in it or no stake in it. Yeah. 
I'll answer the second question first. Sure. So, you see, ultimately, we have to go by the interpretation of a particular provision. In this case, the issue which came before me was, there were old parents who had their house, who had purchased their house out of their hard-earned money, and the son also had a house, though it was a rented house. And the wife said that I would like to stay in that bungalow. So the question was whether such a house owned by the parents falls within the definition of shared household. So in that context, I said that uh, unless the law clarifies that uh, even a house owned by the parents would fall within the definition, the court doesn't have the power to read in between what is stated in the act. That is a, that is a realm, falls within the realm of the legislation. If the legislation feels it could have very well clarified that a shared household includes all houses and property not only owned by the husband but also by also by the parents. But in that matter, I referred the matter to a mediator. I said that instead of fighting and because very often judges don't deliver justice, they deliver judgments. <laughs> And my endeavor has been always Justice. to resolve the issue whenever it comes before me. And I am happy to tell you, with the result, the Chief Justice for practically four to five years had assigned me a family court appeal matter. And I am happy to tell you that I used to take interview of both not only husband, wife, but the in-laws separately sit till 7.30. And... Uh, Many of the couples left my chamber together to go to the matrimonial house. <laughs> and that kind of joy. I remember a case uh, of a Jain, I'm quoting a Jain uh, couple for this reason. The boy was uh, 17 years of marriage, three children. Husband was a chartered accountant, doing very well, working. 14, 15 hours a day, had a good office in port. And, but he used to eat non-vegetarian food, liked to eat once in a while, have a glass of beer. Parents and the wife was very orthodox. So as his uh, profession grew, as he became more busy, he used to order food for home delivery. Wife immediately said nothing doing. She withdrew herself from his company and the matter became very worse. So I realized that this is only a problem of understanding. So I called them separately. I told him that look, just because you earn money and you are very busy, that doesn't mean that you should uh, encroach upon your wife's rights. She's right because the children would be affected if you start having a glass of beer in the house and eating non-vegetarian food, which is contrary to Jain philosophy. So uh, I, I then called her to my chamber and I said that, look, he is working hard. And a time came when he said, I don't want to see her face. You know, things went to, came to such a pass. So then I said, where, where do your fathers, where, where does your father stay? So she said, he stays in Chandil. So I found out a solution. I said that uh, you go to your father's place in the evening before he comes home. Come back in the morning after he leaves house so that you can look after the three children, look after the household. So for three, 
for three months it went on and then both of them came to me i said they said no no let us stop this i said no <laughs> she realized that living with the father was not so easy her brother yeah you brother's, grow up <laughs> brother's wife you <laughs> stood on her and the husband also realized you know i can tell you my wife passed away uh, about 6 years ago of cancer and i must say that a man realizes the importance of a woman when she is not there so he realized what is the place of a wife in the house and then i said you repeat it for three more months and they came together i said if, if you want to eat you go out and eat don't bring it inside your house every year they would bring me on their wedding anniversary mithai <laughs> that was my piece <laughs> so that's counseling come judging and pro- yeah. ensuring justice as so far as the first part is concerned first question regarding these noise pollution you know i have been saying not in the respect of one particular religion but as a policy we should somehow take a decision and i don't know those people who stay near the ganpati visarjan route or some similar festivities for 10 days they it's living hell so i had suggested that the time has come maybe we should have one ganpati for one town or one ward uh, that that was the spirit in which it began also that was the spirit in which uh, yeah lokmanya tilak began but then people give it religious contours you know for no reason and uh, the things then become difficult so that is i, I was compelled to give that order i believe that this after 10 o'clock absolutely we all deserve a peace <laughs> Uh, I have just last two last questions before I throw it open. I know you all must have a lot of questions, but just two questions uh, before I wrap this up with you. Uh, uh, while you have championed the cause of women empowerment, women rights, etc., unfortunately, it does not reflect on the judiciary. Out of the 28 Supreme Court judges, there's just one woman judge that we have out there. Recently, in Feb 2000, uh, we had uh, 2015. Yeah. we had uh, some appointments made there were five new judges that were appointed none of mm. them were women out of all the state high courts that we have we have 611 male judges to 62 women judges so that's less than 10% of representation so when we are championing for that cause uh, and these are appointments made within the judicial process and the judges and the uh, you all decide take a call on something like this why is it that we say, see such a disparity while we talk about women in politics not being uh, empowered enough we see a similar uh, role a similar uh, problem play out even in uh, the judicial system of the country why do you think this is happening i can't say anything about the other states and the supreme court but i can tell you the bombay high court has 11 women judges out of 60 oh that's not that's so a better percentage so we have a full cricket team <laughs> of women judges highest number of women judges and i am the director of uh, was the director of maharashtra judicial academy where we train all the new recruits and i am happy to tell you that in the new recruits 40% are women Yay. 40% so we need to have more people like you empowering women uh, while em- women empower themselves on their own but we also need support coming from like minded voices like you um, happen to be one of them uh, just one last question this is just a fun uh, question priyanka can i just interrupt please Oops. we have the last 10 minutes Oops, sorry oh, sorry so i had so many questions so i'll leave it open to the audience now and i'd request the audience to keep it short uh, introduce yourselves and ask a question please Good morning sir my name is Sakshi 
Yes. Uh, so I'm a student of BA at Ferguson College. So my question is that... Great, great college. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, so my question is that in the recent triple talaq judgment, three out of the five judges quoted a phrase called gender neutral justice. And a lot of uh, questions were raised on the fact that uh, the scope of personal laws versus the fundamental rights, the debate in fact heated up a lot. So sir, in your opinion, is a synthesis between gender neutral justice possible keeping in mind we have personal laws as well? You see, frankly speaking, I have not gone through the entire judgment. The two judges have given a dissenting judgment and three judges have held that triple talaq is not valid. Now, this is a debatable issue. In the Darga case also, what we held was that if it is the settled law, law settled by the Supreme Court is, that if it is not a religious practice, then right of religion, fundamental right of religion, will not be attracted. And uh, then it will have to be tested on uh, constitutional rights. So I believe that uh, women also have constitutional right of equality under Article 14. And if there is a violation of that right, and if it is not a established to be a religious practice, now of course there is a second uh, angle which is advocated by the two dissenting judges and that is to what extent personal law is uh, important and to what extent personal law should have primacy over the gender justice. So I believe that this question is evenly poised. The Supreme Court has now decided this issue and uh, come to think of it ultimately we have a constitution which provides for equality women have struggled for a long time and i believe it was for the first time in the 20th century that women were allowed to vote in england and other countries we have come a long way thereafter, but still there are so many acts, so many provisions which try to empower women. But in spite of that, despite being more than 50%, they are still dominated by dogmas and uh, by sheer kind of uh, tradition. So I believe we need to have a real look because if you remember the landlord judgment where the landlord said that you freeze the standard rent and make it what was payable in 1940. So Fali Nariman in his famous argument says that what law is not static. What was right earlier can be declared as wrong. Sati was right by tradition. Child marriage was right. It was abolished. The government is not taking any decision. And therefore, I believe women need to empower themselves that despite all these acts. And uh, I believe that this struggle will go on. Um, Thank you. Yes. We'll take both the questions together and he can answer them together. So, uh, keep it very brief, please. We don't have too much time. Yeah. Uh, sir, yes. Women widi workers. See, we have uh, many widi workers, women especially. Uh, almost uh, 30 to 40,000, you know, women body workers are there. So I heard that, you know, body worker, uh, this uh, profession will be stopped. So, you know, how will be their life? And uh, 
they will be you know dying of starvation so many problems will take place in no, their life why, why and do families. you say it will be stopped why i heard that it? sir uh, because you yeah, see either it has to be stopped by legislation yeah, only way to stop it is by legislation now if some legislation stops it then the remedy which you have is to challenge that legislation because the high courts and the supreme court has the power to declare any law as ultra virus of the constitution so as long as you don't have a concrete uh, information mere conjecture is of no con- will not help can you take the next question uh, yeah. that's the last question you can ask the question i'll repeat it you can ask the question i'll repeat it no you can ask the question i'll just repeat i it. can hear you yeah i'll repeat it for the audience what do you say when the government decides to disbelieve or or not accept the judgment of a, a justice of a high court as in the case of the foreign ministry judgment came in where the uh, where the maharashtra government said we do not accept the judgment of the of the honorable ju- uh, judge and we believe that he is biased towards the government and the uh, chief justice chief justice had to appoint another right chief and justice in so in fact what really happened was that uh, judgment was not opposed by the government if i am not justice oak justice oak right so ultimately the government had to tender apology and the chief justice restored the matter back to the same court, same court. yes so what what do you say to that practice that practice where the government can say start saying normally it is not done so normally it is not done. Uh, why i'm saying is that and there, therefore there so was it cannot become a precedent pro- and protest. it is uh, it it is something which is one off which was condemned by all i think yeah. even the civil society condemned it a uh, chief justice condemned it and the the bench was restored so and justice oak was given a, an apology from the state government but yes this is exceeding the brief of government where they start questioning the judges and they start questioning the decisions also that come come out of that you can question the decision take it to the supreme court but you c- cannot start uh, delivering uh, you know uh, conclusions on the ju- uh, judge uh uh we don't have much time but okay qu- uh, quickly please no 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 this is help this helpline is available for all women who are in distress yeah so far as working women are concerned in that bpo murder case i had given a direction to the chief justice to treat it as a uh, pil pil was again assigned to me and i framed rules i directed the government to frame rules the government has framed rules and now it has made it compulsory for all bpo companies to ensure right so in such cases your remedy is to go back to the court and court. point out that do you have given a direction so it is not followed so on that note i'd like to thank you all for being such an engaging audience and i would like to thank justice kanade for taking time out for and for such an enriching conversation thank you so much sir thank you so much sir for being with us and thank you so much thank priyanka you. for making us so informative over the whole thing thank you